Good afternoon, and welcome to the Iowa City Foreign Relations Council's program with guest speaker Stratus Yanakoris. Thanks to Mr. Yanakoris and to everyone who has joined us in person and online today. I am Brett Cloyd, member of ICFRC's board and host for today's program. We would like to acknowledge and thank our annual donors, sponsors, and partners for their support. The Iowa Arts Council through the Iowa Department of Cultural Affairs, Humanities Iowa, and the National Endowment for the Humanities. The University of Iowa's International Programs, Honors Program, Public Policy Center, and Center for Human Rights. The Stanley UI Foundation Support Organization, Midwest One Bank, and City Channel 4 for providing online access to all of ICR ICFRC's programs, along with the UI Library's archives. Today's program, in recognition of Earth Day, is also sponsored by a longtime member and great friend of ICFRC, Dr. Conrad Schultz. Dr. Schultz, we appreciate all your wonderful support. ICFRC has adopted the Native American Land Acknowledgement prepared for the City of Iowa City's Ad Hoc Truth and Reconciliation Commission and Human Rights Commission. We recognize that our home community of Iowa City now occupies the homelands of Native American nations to whom we owe our commitment and our dedication. The full text of our acknowledgement is on our website at icfrc.org. It is now my pleasure to introduce Stratus Yanakoros, who will speak about challenges to an equitable net zero carbon transmission. Following his presentation, we'll have about 15 minutes for questions and answers. Stratus is the director of the University of Iowa College of Sustainability. He comes to Iowa from Arizona State University, where he served as project manager and program manager for the Julie Ann Wrigley Global Institute for Sustainability. Prior to that, he was assistant director of the Center for Sustainable Communities at Luther College and sustainability outreach corner coordinator at Colorado State University. Mr. Yanakoris has a bachelor's degree in economics from Loris College and a master's degree in environmental politics and policy from Colorado State University. Please join me in welcoming Stratus Yanakoris to ICFRC today. Thank you for the introduction. I don't know if you need me to move here, uh, if you can pick me up on the... Sounds good? Up a little bit? All right. Is that great? And advancing slides here. Let me check how to do that. All right. All right. Well, thank you today. I'm going to try to um, lay out the details for this talk really quickly, run through this. It, it seems like it's, it's going to be a lot of information, and the nature of, of the discussion is wide-ranging because I'm trying to draw together several threads um, that have imperiled the, the carbon transition we've been undertaking over the last several decades, it seems all at once a lot has changed. And the, the goal today is to bring awareness uh, to this group uh, about how that, that context has changed given the, the occurrences of la over the last two years. Um, I'm going to start out uh, today by talking, uh, lay laying the foundations for this talk uh, around the IPCC's six assessment. So the AR6 that just came out uh, they had a, every two to four years, um, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change comes out with an assessment. And this is some of the leading scientists on the planet get together and they review certain areas of, of what's happening around climate change uh, on planet Earth. And this last assessment that came out, the first part of it came out a few months ago. There was another part that came out about four weeks ago. And then within the last two weeks, they had another piece. So they rolled this out over the course of the year. And it, it starts out by giving an overall assessment. And the last most recent assessment talks about the so what, like how do we stay below one and a half degrees Celsius or two degrees, depending on the pathways we take. I wanna lay that for the context um, for you all today for why climate change is important, right? That's, if we start there, then we can talk about what's happening and why that's also important. Um, some details from the, the latest, AR, latest AR6 assessment uh, talks about uh, the devastating consequences of surpassing the one and a half degrees Celsius target that was set, right? So the IPCC says that in order for the most catastrophic consequential effects of climate change to be avoided, we really need to keep our warming uh, below one and a half degrees Celsius compared to pre-industrial levels. Uh, and the latest assessment, the, the, the quick takeaway is, 
we're on path uh, for about 3.2 degrees Celsius warming. Uh, in the scenarios that they detail, if you go back to this slide here, uh, the risks at three degrees Celsius are, are pretty catastrophic. So some examples, I've pulled some bullets from the AR6 that talk about different um, impacts. One of them that's pretty stark is in the higher end range at that three degrees Celsius uh, warming, uh, you look, you're looking at something between 12 and 29% of biodiversity loss on the planet. So that's aquatic and terrestrial species disappearing. It's really hard to imagine uh, what a world looks like with 30% of, of biodiversity in the planet gone. It's hard to imagine how we exist um, as a human civilization if that scenario plays out. And that's not to be too dire. I know that we shouldn't talk about these things in ways that, that make people you know, turn off or feel like it's very dire. I think we can solve this. But that's sort of that's where we're headed, um, given given where we're falling in terms of our lack of, of commitment to solving this problem. It talks in the AR6 about things that by the year 2100, up to 75 percent of the population could be exposed to life threatening climatic conditions. Uh, long term health impacts uh, are, are mentioned in this. Um, and it just goes on. The report it looks pretty dire this time around. Um, in those pathways, if you look at some of the pledges and targets we've committed to, um, the pledges from the Paris Accord that happened, now I think, trying to think, it was in 2000 in 10, 2012, or no, 2014, I can't remember the, the actual dates for the, for the Paris Accord now, 15. Um, those, those, those targets were, uh, were gonna get us around to 2.4 degrees Celsius warming, which was not ideal. Uh, the current policies that we've actually implemented, that orange streak in the middle, is kind of where we're headed. It's a range of 2.7 to 3.1, really closer to that 3.1 degree um, edge of, of where, what we talk about. Um, all these things are, are really far off of. And, and to give you an idea, even 0.2 or 0.3 degrees of warming avoided is a massive difference in terms of the risks we encounter. For every 0.2 or 0.3 we move up, the risks are huge. So going from 1.5 to 3, it is really a, a big difference. It's a massive difference and we have to do better. The challenge is that if you look at how that looks, according to the IPCC's numbers, if we really want to get to net zero by 2050, right, which is where we kind of need to be zeroed out um, to avoid surpassing that one and a half degrees Celsius mark, we have to bring our emissions down pretty quickly. So we have to probably cut our worldwide emissions in half by the year 2030 in order to have a, a reasonable shot at reducing our total emissions to net zero by the year 2050. If you look at how that looks, the later we take action, the steeper that decline has to be to meet those marks, right? So every year that we don't take action, it gets more costly and the timeline becomes shorter to decline fast enough to stay at one and a half degrees Celsius. That's the context for where we're at in, in thinking about how do we decarbonize our economy in time to avoid these, these catastrophic consequences. Today, what I'm going to talk about is these, these twin, or I guess triple, uh, threats that have come at us in terms of the energy transition. If we went back to late 2019, the discussion around how do we mitigate for climate change was very different. Um, in, in that intervening period, we had a pandemic that hit. Uh, we've had the restart of our economies, which has driven a, a huge amount of inflation into the system and, and imperiled some of the, the processes we've depended upon to decarbonize. And then on top of that, just within the last couple months, uh, Russia decided to invade the Ukraine. These three things have really changed the energy landscape in the world and have, have really changed how we should think about what it means uh, to have an energy transition towards a zero carbon future. I'm going to give you some examples, starting with the pandemic and how that did or didn't change uh, the, the ground we're standing on. Um, if you look at, actually, I'm going to go back here. Um, Actually, let's, let's go to this slide. Um, if you look at what happened during the pandemic, right, in March of 2020, we went into this very strict lockdown. If you had talked to energy analysts or sustainability folks and said, we're going to run this grand experiment and we're virtually going to shut down our economies, no one's going to drive, people aren't going to go to their offices, uh, what happens to our energy consumption, right? They'd say that'll never happen. You can't, you could simulate that, but you can't actually run that experiment. Well, we did, right? We did it in real time. We had data that came back. And you can look here and see that over that time period, depending on how strict lockdown was for different countries, you can see you know, in India that really shut down its economy in different ways. They had almost a 20% decline 
in, in their electricity demand over that period, right? We're talking about just electricity here on this graph. Um, in, in, in the U.S., in some other areas, it was slightly less, but still these, these steep declines in electricity consumption. In spite of those declines, uh, what we saw during that period was the, the CO2 emissions continued to sort of tick on. There, there was about a 5% decline in emissions associated with this huge lockdown, and a lot of that was just behavior change. And then the trend that had been in place 2020 and before, you know, rising CO2, rising NOx, rising methane emissions, uh, just took a little hiccup. You can see on this graph here, uh, as soon as our economies restarted, within about six to eight months, we rebounded back up to our historic emissions levels um, that were pre-pandemic. And so what we realized was that behavior change isn't going to cut it, right? It's the, it's the infrastructure that eats energy and eats carbon on this planet that drives our emissions. And so whether or not, yes, you should turn the, the temperature down in your house a little bit, for sure, you should drive less. But structurally, we have a problem, is that we have a fossil fuel economy. Um, we talk about renewables a lot. Still around 80% of, of our energy consumption comes from fossil fuels, right? And the, the other big chunk of that is nuclear and hydro. So wind and solar make up a tiny little fraction of what we have for consumption. If you look at this graph here, um, you see coal and oil are the gray and the blue. And then at the very tippy top, you've got like these little slivers of renewables that are in there. When we talk about a wholesale transition to getting off of oil and coal, uh, it requires that starting today, we revolutionize, revolutionize our economies, right? And so we're, we're kind of behind there. I want to take you know a, a step for, forward and say, uh, so we were in the pandemic in the middle of it, and we shut down our economies for this, this very brief moment, and we got a picture of what our energy structure looks like, and then we restarted everything wholesale. And as it ticked up and it started eating energy again, we rebounded dramatically Rather than re rebounding using renewables that were not in place, it's coal and, and gas that are driving that energy demand to restart our economies that are feeding the need for pent-up demand for products and supplies, shipping materials, et cetera. Um, during that time, though, there was a meeting, the COP26, that followed from the 2015, as Ty said, uh, Paris Accord. Uh, in, 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 20, in, in, in Glasgow, in, in November of 2021, everyone got together and there's a lot of discussion about the failure of that conference to really set the targets we needed. But one really big bright spot that I was excited about, that a lot of people were excited about, uh, was this pledge that came out of it for a 30% cut in emissions um, that 120, 105 countries signed up to. Uh, and I want to spend a little time today talking about just methane as one of those climate pieces that, that can, we can draw a thread through to the, to the Ukrainian-Russian crisis and rise of inflation in the pandemic to show how hard some of this stuff is. Um, countries agreed to this 30% cut. Um, it was 105 countries, and if it all came to fruition, it would cut our projected increases in CO2 emissions, or I guess the final emissions number by about 0.2 degrees Celsius, right? So a not insignificant amount. And almost immediately on the heels of that deal going forward, uh, we started to see the unraveling of that deal happen for various reasons. But before I get to that, I want to talk about what that means, what that methane cut, and what methane in general means for the planet. So here I've just got a whole bunch of text I try not to do, but I want to put it out there in a way where you can see it. There's a few things here. A 30% cut in, in methane emissions worldwide is the equivalent of zeroing out emissions from the entire transportation sector. So if you take all the fugitive emissions and all the emissions that that we emit on the planet, and you cut them by 30%, it's the same as decarbonizing our transportation infrastructure. So it's, it's a very big deal, but let's talk about why it's technically hard to do. So structurally, if you look at all the emissions that go out in a given year, about 70% of those, if we're talking about oil and gas, the oil and gas industry, about 70% of those emissions are technically easy to take care of right now from a technical perspective, right? We have the technology, to reduce 70% of those emissions coming out of oil and gas, the oil and gas industry. Let's look at particularly the United States context and the, the, the Permian Basin in Texas, right? If you look at the current status quo in that industry in that particular shale patch, uh, about 3.7% of its methane uh, gets released into the atmosphere, right, from, from different sources. At that rate of loss, right, at that rate of loss, we can compare that to what the IE estimates – 
for near-term methane emissions as a tipping point. And the IEA says that at 3.2% emissions, right, so, so less than the 3.7, if we had that as a loss rate across the, across the board, right, from oil and gas production, it makes emissions from methane from the production of oil and gas uh, more problematic than actual coal combustion. And the reason for this is that methane as a greenhouse gas in the near term, so in the short term, has about 90 times the global warming potential of CO2. So if you think about CO2 emissions that we often talk about, methane short term, near term, is about 90 times the global warming potential of CO2. So longer term, because it comes out of the atmosphere faster, it's about 30 times the global warming potential over the long run. But when we're talking about 5, 10, 15 years to get a handle on this, methane emissions today punch a lot harder than most other emissions. So we have to get a handle on them. The other problem is that, is that often uh, the reason this stuff gets emitted is because there's no regulation on it. It's been hard to see those emissions coming out. Um, it's been costly for the industry to actually take care of them, right? And there's been no enforcement. A few things are changing around that, though, here in the U.S. Number one is there's just been a few satellites launched that are watching oil fields in the U.S. and around the world. They can pick up about 80% of production and see where those methane emissions are coming from in real time. So we know where the bad actors are. We know where the emissions are coming from. That's the first step. You can't, you can't manage what you can't measure, right? So we're measuring it better. The other thing is that with gas prices being really high right now, the, the cost to engage in mitigation strategies um, are almost no cost. And, and to explain what that means is that if you're letting natural gas go into the atmosphere right now and the gas prices are really high, that's money floating into the atmosphere. So companies have an incentive to start to get a handle on and tighten up how much they're, they're leaking. Even if they're going after, after oil and the natural gas is a byproduct, Rather than flaring it or rather than letting it go into the atmosphere, they have a, a, a reason to get it back into, the, into the, the global commodity energy pipeline. Uh, the last part is that Engie, who actually happens to be a partner at the University of Iowa, a French company, has recently pulled out of a very high-profile liquefied natural gas project in the Permian Basin in Texas because they had massive concerns about emissions. So you're starting to see companies that have these net zero goals or want to position themselves as being concerned about carbon emissions nixing big LNG projects because they don't see the safeguards around wellhead casings and around strategies to curtail emissions, and they know that they're going to, get, they're going to come in for trouble when they try to count natural gas as a less climate-active uh, fossil fuel compared to coal. Uh, when, when people point out that all the emissions associated with that commodity chain make it less or, or make it more potent than it is, right? So those things are happening and if you look at this, this graph here, you see the energy sector, right? 73% of, of our total uh, global emissions coming from different areas. Energy is the big chunk, right? If you solve that, the other things you kind of get to, but the ways we use energy constitute about three quarters of our emissions. So let's talk now about what, what that means in the context of restarting from the pandemic, right? So we went through that period of time. We shut down our economies ever so briefly. Then we've come roaring back. Not only has that roar back been done on the back of fossil fuels, uh, the other problem is that it created these bottlenecks, right? Uh, we found out that our supply chains are very fragile. You can't just start and stop your supply chain. Things unravel, there's consequences. It's, it's, it's a very delicate machine that runs to make sure that I have strawberries or bananas on my plate or a Prius in my driveway it requires a whole bunch of international components running really carefully. And when you stop that supply chain, Getting it restarted is complicated. And you add on to that all the pent-up demand that industry had just from that, that short period of time. And we had this acceleration in our economy. Right? We also juiced our economy with federal money. Uh, a lot of economies around the world did the same thing. And what happened is everyone's competing suddenly for the raw materials to make the products that people are demanding. So when you look particularly in the space of automakers, right, access to the chips that go in the cars, the rare earths, that constitute those chips, the aluminum, the metals, all of the materials and components that go into a car are, are, are similar materials that go into solar panels, that go into you know, making stoves for kitchens, refrigerators, and so on. And you have this competition for, for the resources that make the renewable technologies that, that fuel you know, the, the adoption of renewables that replaces fossil fuels. What does that mean, 
What does that mean in reality? It means that the assumptions based upon the falling price of a solar panel or the falling prices of technologies were 2019. Now you see that companies that are trying to put up solar fields are talking about deliveries of solar panels two years out. They're often not able to get the components at a price. You know, the, the prices and the cost of installing a solar panel are going up from raw materials. At the same time that we had predicated, a lot of our modeling had talked about a, a sort of a Moore's law in effect of the falling price of a solar panel and how as, and it's been happening for over 12 or 13 years now, every year the price of a solar panel came down. And we had extrapolations about those costs and those drove conversations around clean hydrogen generated by these technologies. Um, the adoption of renewables to replace fossil fuels was all predicated on this falling price, which at least for the foreseeable, has, has, has gone up in price, right? So that, that, that imperils that transition, and we're competing for those resources. That goes to the lithium for batteries in cars, across the entire supply chain in the mining industry, in rare earths, in, in other kinds of metals. We're competing with everything right now to, to deploy solar, uh, wind, wind, and other, other technologies against right, the restart of the economy. So inflation has raised prices, but inflation is also a symptom of people demanding things uh, that they can't get, right? And so that's where we're at. And the transition is that the restart has impacted the renewables transition. Then Russia invades Ukraine, right? And that really further destabilizes markets everywhere. Uh, if you look at the European Union historically, they've made this deal to ignore autocratic behavior and threats from the border of the European Union because they really needed uh, the fossil fuels that come out of Russia. You know, some of the countries there, Germany gets up to 40% of its, um, you know, natural gas from, from, from Russia. So they kind of made this deal to look the other way. When, when, when Vladimir Putin decided to invade Ukraine, it changed the calculus in those countries, right? They went from looking at um, industrial security, national security as an energy security question, to looking overall at their, at their national security in the context of an aggressive neighbor on their border who was crossing lines, uh, things we hadn't seen since World War II. And, and it, it, it jolted them, right? There have been these arguments all the time of don't build Nord Stream 2, reduce dependence on, on, on Russian oil and gas. And everyone knew that was there, but the impetus was kind of like, you could make a deal with the devil and just get on day by day because you had this, this free flow of Russian gas and oil coming into the European Union. And from an industrial perspective, who wants to stop it, right? Who wants to change that immediately? Well, the calculus changed when, when Putin invaded. And suddenly, you had seen this nascent movement around thinking about a Green New Deal in Europe, which is farther along than, than in the U.S., really take flight. And so the European Union over the last couple mo months or so has started to double down on commitments to thinking about how to make this renewables transition faster. How can we get off of dependence on Russian oil and gas? So from a climate perspective, right, it catalyzes the R&D we needed to think about alternatives to oil and gas that, that inherently is going to trickle over to other parts of the world. Um, at the same time, though, the, in, the, in the interim, they're increasing their, their terminals for liquefied natural gas, right? Uh, Lithuania and I think Finland have gone together on a floating terminal. They're going to build out more capacity in the Hanseatic coast of Germany. And, and where is that liquefied natural gas going to come from? Some of it's going to come from Qatar. But a lot of it's going to come from the shale fields in the southern U.S., in the Permian Basin and other areas, right off the coast of, uh, right by Houston, in that area. So, so what does that portend, right? At the time when, when Europe is moving towards saying, we are going to find all sorts of strategies uh, to get off of Russian oil and gas, temporarily some LNG, but other R&D into clean hydrogen, uh, the U.S. has kind of pushed the other direction, right? We are also going to invest in R&D. There's, there's money in the pipeline from the Build Back, well, it's not Build Back Better, the previous uh, uh, federal uh, allotment. You know, we have $9 billion that we're going to spend on clean hydrogen R&D. Um, but in general, the push here is to say we have to, we have to drill more. And so you just saw that the, Obama administ or the, the Biden administration under pressure has expanded um, and revisited leases on federal land for drilling, even though there's something like 12 or 1,500 permits that haven't been used, uh, they're signaling that they're willing to, to double down on that politically to not be viewed as hampering our energy independence, energy security, our ability to export energy. Um, 
domestically oil and shas, oil, oil and, and shale production is taking off. And so at the same time that Europe is trying to divest from fossil fuels and moving towards a renewable transition, in the, in the short term, at least in the U.S., we're going to be doubling down on, on, on the production of shale and oil, right? What does that mean for methane? More wellheads that are, that are prone to fugitive emissions means a dramatic escalation in the potential for methane emissions here in the southern U.S., unless we have policies and regulations that, that enable us to, to get that gas in a smart way and frack for the oil and gas in a smart way. So those two political landscapes at the same time are shifting the conversation, right? Uh, going back to clean hydrogen here, what the European Union was talking about, clean hydrogen is basically the production of hydrogen as a, as a fuel, right? And it works really well as an industrial fuel to replace natural gas. Um, was predicated on a falling price for a solar panel, a falling price for wind energy, uh, to reach cost parity with natural gas or coal eventually, other forms of fossil fuels. When you see that that bottleneck in the supply chain has pushed up the price of solar panels, has slowed down the deployment of solar panels, it also imperils the basic premise of why clean hydrogen works, right? It's not, clean hydrogen is predicated on having enough renewable energy to make that hydrogen. If you can't make it reliably at cheap cost, you can't even build out the scale we have to build to put clean hydrogen into play, that transition, it, it doesn't really happen in the same way. So all of that being said, I want to take a minute before I you know, turn it over to questions here to talk about why this matters from an equity perspective. It's part of the title. And the issue is that as we go about thinking about how we're going to get these materials, right? Um, and I'm going to bring the, the example of lithium mining in a minute here. Uh, it requires that we think about the equity of, of that transition. Um, and I use the term zones of sacrifice, right? The, the most familiar zone of sacrifice we have is, is the West Virginia Appalachian area, um, where you see in the picture in the upper left-hand corner, um, you know, mountaintop removal on um, the destruction of creeks in that area, the poisoning of their water supply. And then generally, the people of, of West Virginia not participating fully in the economic benefits of that transition. As, the, as the, you know, one of the, the ecological treasures of the planet, really, which is the Appalachia, has been degraded, the people who live there have not benefited in any way uh, from that transition. So we're going to see that play over again here um, with, with lithium production. When you look at the Atacama in the Atacama Plain in, in, in Peru uh, or in Chile, and you look at the boreal forests of Canada in the bottom left-hand corner, and now increasingly looking at areas in Bolivia and then also um, areas of northern Nevada where tribal lands are. These are all areas where that lithium has to come from to make the cars that we absolutely have to have to transition to electric vehicles and um, that are fueled by electrical power that, that kind of break that carbon cycle. But how we do that, how that happens to what happens to communities in that process is one example of it's not a free lunch. It's not a cost-free uh, endeavor. And you can bring that up over and over again. You know, the, the rare earths that we talk about, um, they're not so rare, actually. Um, but they're, they're hard to get to, right? You can remove tons and tons of any mountain in the U.S. and find rare earths in it. The question is, what are you willing to do environmentally to get those materials, right? Historically, China has been much more willing uh, to engage in that kind of mining. It's been harder from a regulatory perspective in the U.S. to do that. And so they've led the world in sort of capturing the production and sale of those rare earths. They're not rare. They're just environmentally devastating, uh, if not mined in the right ways. And so these questions have to be part of this, right? When I talk about this transition, I say, we had these bottlenecks around materials. Even if we didn't, we have to think about where this stuff is being mined from and what those communities around that mining or that extraction, how they're kept whole or how they benefit from that process. Um, secondarily, I want to talk about this idea that we, of climate change in general, right? We talk about CO2 emissions in this very abstract sense of one and a half degrees Celsius or two degrees Celsius. We may talk about people being hurt, but generally speaking, uh, we, we know what that looks like. I, I can identify who the first line um, you know, people on the planet are around these issues. And they're, if you're poor or, or depending on your geography, climate change is, is going to have a much more severe impact on you. And the example I'll bring here is just simple. I used to live in, in Phoenix, Arizona. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what, what climate change looks like depending on who you are, 
So I lived in South Tempe, actually, next to Phoenix. And when I got there, I'm a bike rider. And I looked to see what are the bus routes. So from my apartment when we moved in uh, to get to Arizona State's campus, uh, on a bike was about, you know, 20, 25 minutes. In my car, it was about the same because of the traffic patterns. If I were to take the bus, it would be an hour and 15 minutes. I would spend the same amount of time in transit, but I would spend time standing in between three bus changes in the sun in 115 to 120 degree heat in the summer, waiting to get to campus uh, in that context, right? So hotter degree days standing in the sun means something very different for me in my car, driving from my air conditioned apartment to the parking garage and into an air conditioning building at ASU versus someone who's trying to get to work uh, at a job and trying to use a bus, taking an hour and 15 minutes to get there and probably an hour and 30 or hour 40 going home because of traffic patterns. So they're spending three hours um, in transit, most of which they're sitting in a bus stop that's unshaded in Phoenix in the summer, right? On top of that, in my apartment, when it gets hotter, I just crank the AC up a little more, right? Or the AC works a little harder. So unless I have to step outside, uh, I'm not feeling the real impacts of a hot day, right? I can afford to, to mitigate that effect by turning the AC up. If you're energy insecure in South Phoenix or South Tempe in Arizona, uh, you are less likely to run the air conditioning as much because the energy bills can be extravagant, right? Depending on who you are. When you don't run the AC, you also don't run the air filter. So Phoenix has some of the worst ozone in the country. Ozone is like getting a sunburn on your lungs. That's what I would, the equivalent for those of you that want to understand what ozone is. It's a sunburn on your lungs, right? It's a combination of, of um, 2.5 PM, other pollutants with sunlight. It creates this noxious kind of this gas that, that burns your lungs. So there's other pollutants coming off the highways. There's other air quality issues. There's dust storms, haboobs in the summertime. If you're not running your air filter all the time, your indoor air quality is pretty bad. You see high rates of asthma in those communities. You see heat stress and multi-generational households in those communities. They don't have the ability uh, to mitigate the circumstances of climate change. So objectively, we're in Phoenix. The same thing is happening, right? It's getting warmer. But how that plays out depends on how much money I have and who I am. And you can see this. I could bring up example after example. None of us are really as insulated as we think against these issues. I say sort of like, in the very immediate, I can turn the AC up. But long term, the consequences of climate change are unpredictable, right? We've seen that in conflict over and over over the last few years. Um, you may think you're safe, upper middle class, that can turn on a dime because our political systems are too fragile to really absorb some of these impacts. So I'll wrap up by saying that we have this transition that we have to make, right, to keep below catastrophic global warming. Um, a lot of that right now depends upon this energy transition away from fossil fuels, like the preponderance of it does. There's land use issues, there's agricultural issues that we have to solve, but it's really energy born and the pandemic, coupled with the resurgence in inflation driven by bottlenecks in supply chains that haven't come back to normal, by the way, right? Our supply chains are really still trying to figure out what this new normal looks like. And then uh, this invasion of, 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 you know, Ukraine by Russia, which on that count, too, I don't want to I don't want to ignore a gloss over the human tragedy uh, directly what's happening there. Uh, that's horrifying and needs to stop. And we need to do everything we can to stop it. Um, but it's having consequences for this broader transition away from fossil fuels at the same time that it's changing the context for research and development. The key thing for, these fo for you folks here today is to think about when you see that stuff happening, to think about how these systems are all connected. And we think about the goals and strategies we have, how internationally connected they are and how difficult they are. And the last point is to not lose sight of people as the end point of climate change, right? This is not about protecting polar bears. It is and it's not. Uh, it's about people on the planet. And depending on who you are, this means very different things for you. And so when we design our solutions, when we think about problems, we have to understand that equity component, or I don't think we really, really design the solutions in the right way if we don't think about that person taking an hour and 15 minutes to get on a bus who can't afford to run the AC, who can't afford to run the filter, who can't afford decent food, who has cardiopulmonary disease, who has higher rates of asthma, and, and is now suffering from heat stress, right? That's the person that climate change affects. And that's why we have to think about this transition, um, making this transition in the right way.
So I know I've kind of thrown a lot out there, but I will now take questions from all of you if you, if you are so inclined. Thanks, Russ. I have a few remarks and then okay, we'll yeah, get yeah. to the questions. Great talk. Really appreciate that. Um, so now we're going to move to our question and answer portion of our program. For those of you who are present, please raise your hand and the microphone will be brought to you to ask your question. For those of you watching online, you can text your questions to 319-600-2588. That's 319-600-2588. While we're waiting for questions to come in, ICFRC wants to thank all its members and donors for their support. If you would like to join ICFRC or make a gift to support our programs, please go to icfrc.org and thank you. So, in-person questions? Catherine? Thank you, that was a very interesting talk and <clears throat> there's so many things I'd like to ask you about, but let me take you back to uh, kind of where you started. Um, I'm still uh, not really sure I understand the relationship, for example, between methane and carbon dioxide. I'd always thought that carbon dioxide was our big, the big problem with um, driving cars and things like that, but, but you're suggesting that the methane is, is a, a larger problem, actually, and so I wonder if you could just tell, say a little more about the relationship of that and particularly what we need to do about CO2 as well. As yeah, yeah, that's a, actually a really great question. I wish I had a lot of time to go into that, like I do with my Climate 101 students. Um, Basically, we talk about everything. We, we just, for, for expediency, we talk about CO2 emissions. But there are other uh, climate forcing or, or greenhouse gases that we also emit, right? Um, nitrous oxide, um, you know, uh, NOx and SOx we talk about, um, uh, chlorofluorocarbons, right, from uh, refrigerants, and then methane that all have different effects in the atmosphere, right? So if carbon dioxide is the baseline for, we know that, Carbon dioxide is like a carbon and the two oxygens, right? Like the two poles sticking out. And it sits in the atmosphere at 400 parts per million right now, right? So if we talk about what's in the atmosphere, if we, get, if we gathered a million molecules from the atmosphere, 400 of them will be CO2. That's how potent it is as, as a gas. And it sits out there in the atmosphere. When you combust it, right, hydrocarbons, right? You break that energy bond to get the energy. You end up with water and a carbon that goes in the atmosphere and grabs onto two oxygens becomes CO2. When those go up in the atmosphere, they sit there for hundreds, thousands of years, right? They're, they're, they kind of wash out in a cycle, but it's really slow. And those bonds are really good at gathering energy. So when the sun shines, it hits the earth and reflects back onto space. The reason we don't turn into a cold rock at night like Mars is because we have CO2 in our atmosphere and it grabs onto that energy and holds it there. And it creates that stability between day and night where it's not too cold or too hot. CH4, which is methane, is a carbon and four hydrogens. So here's my carbon and my legs and arms are, are the four hydrogens. It has more bonds. It has a better ability to grab the energy out of the atmosphere. When, you, when, you, when a banana rots, it, it emits CH4 methane. When you burn natural gas, it emits methane. Or sorry, it emits carbon dioxide. But if you let it go up in the atmosphere naturally, it's just in its pure form, it's methane. Methane... Uh, it has a faster cycle. It comes out of the atmosphere on the order of like 100 years, right? So, so over that period of time, compared to CO2, uh, its ability to warm or potential for warming is about 30 times the impact of a carbon dioxide molecule, right? So it grabs 30 times the energy that a carbon dioxide molecule does in the atmosphere. Over the very short run, over a 10-year period, it's about 90 times. Right? We, we, we extrapolate because it comes out faster, so we, we, we normalize it. But all of the things that emit methane, right, rotting food and landfills, the fugitive emissions from, from natural gas wells, things like that, in the near term, if we're trying to solve climate change, they actually punch a lot harder, right? If you're trying to solve something, you don't want to be adding 90 times the effect of one CO2 molecule to the atmosphere. When you burn natural gas, it cuts those, those CO2 equivalent emissions in half. So natural gas in the atmosphere going up just as it is has a certain effect. Say it's like short-term 90 times the global warming potential of CO2. When you burn it, right, for some kind of use, that, that effect is probably half. It's 45 times the global warming potential. 
So a lot of times people should denote it as CO2 with a small e behind it to say CO2 equivalents. If you look at um, NOx, right, emissions from vehicles, they're about 278 times the global warming potential of CO2. But they're such a tiny fraction of what comes out of the tailpipe that although they are really, really bad and we want to get them out of the atmosphere, they're still overwhelmed by the sheer volume of CO2 in the atmosphere. So those are some of the differences that, that you th want to think about here. But again, 400 parts per million is CO2 in the atmosphere. Uh, methane is a fraction of a fraction of that. But these things just grab energy, right? And 99% of the atmosphere is oxygen and nitrogen. They do nothing, right? Oxygen is an O and an O bonded like this, two bonds. Uh, nitrogen is an, is an N and an N, three bonds between. And they kind of vibrate in the air, but they're not really good. They're like me at a dance party, right? They're not very good at moving or doing anything. Uh, CO2 is, is a much better dancer, and CH4 is like, you know, pick your person. I don't know who's a famous dancer, like Fred Astaire, I don't know. But I think that that's, that's the issue is that methane in the short term uh, has this huge global warming potential. We have to get it out of the atmosphere. The thing is, it's easy to stop technically, and that's why... Uh, not easy, but 70% of industrial emissions from oil and gas, we have the technical ability to take care of. And we, we now, because of the high price of gas, the economics make more sense than ever. If we're going to frack for gas, and I don't see it going away as a transition fuel for a variety of reasons, we at least have to make sure that we, we get a handle on fugitive emissions. Uh, so, Ty. Thanks, Stratus. That's a really nice uh, presentation and very in instructive. I, since we're on the methane topic, I, I had one comment and then a, a sort of broader question. It, it's true, methane's a big problem, and especially in the Permian Basin. Um, I think it's also important to understand that the oil and gas industry is not the largest contributor to methane in the atmosphere. Right. It yeah. comes from livestock, it comes from wetlands. Um, so it's a bigger problem than the oil and gas. And rice field production. Rice, yeah. Um, I, I just want to note that the Permian Basin is the largest problem with methane, but it's mainly an oil-producing region, not a gas-producing mm -hmm. region. And that those fugitive emissions come from really old infrastructure that's yep. being used. So much of the new fracking for gas is newer equipment that doesn't leak as much, mm -hmm. and at least, you know, not enough to, to make it worse than coal. Mm -hmm. And about uh, almost all of the methane leaks in the Permian Basin come from about 30 facilities yep. that are easy to identify. We have the we technology. Have the satellites now to identify. We have the yeah. technology. We just need policy. We had the policy under Obama. The problem was the Trump administration mm -hmm. rolled back regulations on methane emissions, yeah. and Biden's pu putting them back in place. It's gonna. We lost four years, though. Four years we really needed. Mm -hmm. So that. But brings me to my question about policy. You said, you know, we're not going to solve this by behavioral change. Right. We need a structural transformation of our economy, and it's going to require policy. So I'm just, I'd like to hear what you think are the most urgent, I mean, what will be the most effective policies now? My students always say, what can I do now? What do we need to do right now? So how would you prioritize policy at this point? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if, if, I, if I was king for a day, right? Is that you're asking me if I, was, uh, if I was the climate czar and I had all the abilities to do what I wanted to do. Yeah, I mean, I get, you know, in the Permian Basin, um, the explosion of shale production for oil. I mean, there'll be some, you know, the production of natural gas for LNG export to the Europeans now is going to be a thing, but that shale primary production, the issue was that the gas was like, what do you do with it? Either flare it or just ignore it and vent it, right? I mean, a lot of the, the really egregious actors at 30%, they're just venting it into the atmosphere, which at least flare it. You know, don't put it to industrial use and get that benefit, but don't, don't let it vent. And I think we, we can see them, we can identify them, and we should have to go after and stop that. It's such a low-hanging piece of fruit, and it's a big impact. Um, Policy-wise, you know, I look more and more at the idea of a cost-neutral, it's not a, a silver bullet, but a cost-neutral carbon tax that, that is pegged to consumption of carbon, and it's, it, it is returned back to, on a per capita basis, citizens in the U.S., um, to help drive this from that market perspective. I think Cato Institute or Heritage had talked about that in the 90s before it became uncool. Uh, and and that, that's a big thing. I think we have to have some way to, that, that's better than cap and trade, right? Cap and trade, 
is so complicated and there's so many ways to think about how to, to game that system. Do just a pure market-based, like, like people who are market believers talk about, um, price for carbon tax. I think I want to see more immediate investment in R&D around clean hydrogen beyond the $9 billion that was earmarked for this. I think that's going to be a great way to, per, to re, replace industrial uses that aren't... A lot of people say, why can't we do everything with wind and solar? Well, some of our systems, like the University of Iowa, right, we have to push steam. So we got to burn something. We have to have some kind of mass, thermal mass, to push the steam to our tunnels because we have a hospital that needs to sterilize things and depends on that. We can't electrify everything right now. It's just too costly. Um, but clean hydrogen gives us one more wedge, one more tool in our arsenal uh, to, to change that. We have to push R&D there. We need to also figure out how to streamline. Um, there's issues coming up right now with solar development, even in the state of Iowa or the Midwest. There's a, the, the demand for solar from the Fortune 100 companies that are locating data centers here or activities is huge. And the pushback has been... Uh, the corn suitability index is one thing that's been brought up, is that you can't put solar panels on fields that would have been good for corn production. Uh, we have to change those incentives a little bit. And this is where I step into, you know, heresy. Um, but, but, you know, ethanol production, if you look at the equivalent um, land area used to produce, uh, you know, I think it's something like, I forget the actual numbers now, but just a handful of solar panels does what all this corn that we have in production does. Um, to provide, you know, the equivalent energy to move a vehicle. And so the argument is not replacing land. If, if corn is only used as a fuel, like predominantly in the state, you know, some 50% or more of, of our production goes to, or 40% goes to ethanol right now. Um, deploying solar, solar panels um, at utility scale that, that we can own, farmers can own, is, is, a, is a good transition. We have to figure out the politics of that and sell it differently. Um, the, the other thing I think that is really important is moving away from natural gas um, in our houses. So uh, air source heat pumps is a big one. Um, people talk in the South, in the Sun Belt, it's, it's a foregone conclusion. It makes sense. In the upper Midwest, there's issues when you go below 20 degrees, 15 degrees, that you run into efficiency issues and you have to have that gas back up anyway. And so it's cost prohibitive. But I think that in the, in the cities of Minneapolis, they're really figuring this out. They're figuring out how to either put baseboards down for those few days a year, handful of days of degree days where it, where it exceeds that minus 15 degrees mark. And then also figuring out how to make these efficient, these systems more efficient. We have to have heat pumps replacing natural gas furnaces and houses um, across the, the country. Those are the really big ones that I, that I think are, are important. Um, but I can go on, but I'll stop there. Uh, we have a question in the back here. I, I guess this is a, is a comment. Um, but we have 35,000 miles of pipelines going through Iowa right now. And um, half of those were built before 1970, before they really started regulating. And most of our, uh, I can't remember the term, but uh, wayward uh, emissions is coming from those old pipelines. And it seems to me that, that a policy that would allow those uh, pipelines to atrophy would be extremely helpful. And my understanding is they can't uh, um, stop emitting gas in the fracking areas because they have th no place to transport it. And so the last pipeline that the environmentalists and the Indians climbed all over as being a terrible idea uh, didn't seem that terrible to me. Uh, the second the second thing I wondered about is that um, airports uh, and airport land, for example, um, the Cedar Rapids Airport has approximately, I think, 3,000 acres. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, when you get to a situation where it's publicly owned land, you certainly could put um, uh, solar on that without uh, violating a lot of the NIMBY um, pushback that we are currently getting. Mm -hmm. And my thought was, because Cedar Rapids owns their streets, there's a law that um, you can't sell solar off-site. So as a result of that, for example, you couldn't devote three subdivision lots to a solar field to um, do the uh, subdivision. 
because the large uh, utility companies kind of got there first and they prohibited that. And it seems to me that a city could um, develop it on an airport and feed all of their city buildings and um, various people because they own the land through the streets. That's a thought. So, so yes to all of that. <laughs> I think that, you know, uh, I know, and I know Cedar Rapids Airport is, is I've heard that they, they are thinking about solar and the ways that they've got a whole sustainability plan. I sat on a, I sit on a group um, that meets to talk about, you know, Cedar Rapids' ambitions um, to be more sustainable as an airport. And I think that those things could could come into play. Um, I also think that this this notion of the pipelines, yeah, I'm an environmentalist and I'm a sustainability advocate and I worry about climate change. But sometimes the the structure of what a pipeline does or doesn't do in the near term, you don't want to undermine the long-term transition by having these sort of hard lines around shutting down, you know, I think there's a lot of groups that are like, shut it all down today immediately, it is not productive, right? And, and again, getting back to the equity question, who gets hurt the most by high prices and who is gonna vote with, against the very policies that you're trying to implement if you don't consider them as people who have spent a higher percentage of their income on transportation, on energy. You can't just spike prices to, do the tra to make the transition work. And so I think that equity is important and thinking about, yes, yesterday we need to be done burning carbon, but we have 15 or 20 years, right, to figure this stuff out. Let's go after the right stuff and not the wrong stuff in the interim. And the idea of shutting things down willy-nilly or wholesale, whether it be existing nuclear facilities that are producing energy or, or pipelines that are already in the ground, um, I tend to be take a more nuanced approach to that, and I'm not going to, you know, be on the record saying more. <laughs> yes, <clears throat> um, thanks for your presentation. Uh, I'm trying to understand the impact of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. You did mention that um, if the U.S. is digging for more oil to make up for the shortage, and if the Europeans are also looking for alternate sources of oil from other countries other than Russia. What difference did the invasion make? From the environmental perspective, um, I, I fully understand the human impact, but from the purely environmental perspective, right. what, did, uh, what difference did the invasion make? Right. So there's, there's this near-term thing, as I mentioned, that, that right away, you know, they're going to expand in the Hanseatic Coast LNG terminals, terminals to get liquefied natural gas to replace that pipeline natural gas. It would have been coming from Nord Stream 2, they shut down, and the existing pipelines. They want to start to move away from Russian natural gas, right? Um, so statically, that didn't make a huge difference. What it did do was that that's really hard. Even, even with all the efforts, even if the U.S. goes full in on, on using, producing uh, natural gas from shale oil down the Permian Basin across the U.S., we pipe it to the coast, we liquefy it, we got to build the terminals, we don't have enough. Right? So right now today, we're at capacity. We can't send more LNG to Europe per se, right? In the short term, uh, we're getting it from Qatar. Qatar has said they'll increase LNG exports to Europe, all these, all these places. That's to replace that backlog. But the Europeans are looking at that. These are, not, these are like temporary like stopgap solutions. The thing they have to do is massively increase renewable energy, the renewable energy portfolio in Europe, right? So the R&D, the research and, de and development, the money that will be spent is going to produce the technological landscape to get off of LNG too, off of the liquefied natural gas in, in, in the more medium term. Shorter term, the other thing that's happening is for a long time, the gas prices in the U.S., you know, per MMBTU, per, per, you know, per unit were around $3, right? absurdly low, where in Europe they're paying 9 10 sometimes even more. That arbitrage in normal commodities doesn't, doesn't like, like, they, it would find a way to, to level itself out. Because it was so sticky though, you know, you, you can't take that gas and, and give it to like someone else who wants to buy it very easily. We had these ex exceptionally low gas prices. If we build more terminals at the coast and Europe has this demand to get it out, it's going to keep our gas prices in the U.S. Um, higher than they've ever been. We'll see how, how good we are at fracking for gas, but gas prices are higher. They're going to go higher. They're going to stay higher. If you look out to 2024, 2025, that creates this parity that we didn't have with other technologies in the renewable sector that makes them look more attractive cost-wise, right? So the, the conundrum of the oil and gas industry has always been keep gas prices high and oil prices high, 
but not too high, too long, because you imperil that transition, right? Um, you want to keep people addicted to that stuff. If you're Saudi Arabia or whoever, you want people to use it. You don't want to create an incentive for the U.S. to really find um, methods of, of renewable technologies that, that decrease their dependence on your foreign oil. Right now, with gas prices this high, the arguments for, for transitions to other things uh, become better. The R&D makes it better. So short term, we're going to have this spike. And it's bad because of the timing of where we're at. But longer term, that also kind of feeds into this need of, of Europe to diversify and go into renewables a little harder than they were planning to. And for the U.S., um, with higher gas prices, I mean, talking about natural gas, right? Um, and even, even, you know, gasoline, that makes these other transitions more attractive in, in the near term. One, one thing I'd bring up there real quickly is that um, back in the, you know, latter part, earlier part of the last decade, Saudi Arabia had pursued a strategy of trying to kill the U.S. shale industry, right? Making gas so cheap or oil so cheap that they couldn't get a barrel out as cheaply and killing our entire industry here because they saw it as a threat. Well, what that ended, it, it did put pressure, but what it ended up doing was making the industry more lean. And so they learned to go from getting a barrel of oil out of the ground at $60 a barrel down to now, I, th I heard latest was like 30 or $35 a barrel, which makes it some of the cheapest produced oil on the planet. And so that's also another thing you have to watch out for is the more investment you put there, the more you think and learn how to do this stuff, the more efficient they get at that form of extraction. So it's this, it's this tug of war in this game that's going on. But I think that longer term, the Europeans getting more serious about getting off Russian gas and oil is not only good from a geopolitical perspective for peace, right, and security. It also is going gonna, is gonna to accelerate uh, research into renewables. And, and then the consequences of that will affect the U.S. and others. So uh, we now conclude our program. I want to give a big thank you to Stratus Yankoris for his excellent presentation and for sharing his expertise with us today. Unfortunately, we'll have to do a rain check on our gift, but I will be in the future honored to present you with ICFRC's highly coveted mug for coffee, tea, or the beverage of your choice. So look for that. Thanks for joining us today. We are adjourned. <laughs>